Oh, oh, oh. Oh. All right, everyone. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, get started on the meeting, please. So um, I'll call the meeting to order at 110, please. Um, and uh, Rick, I think you said one person was vulnerable. Uh, Ryan is as an alternate is vulnerable. Uh, he can, Ryan, you can vote until Tony joins us. If Tony joins us, then Ryan, you have to stop voting. He can still participate. So we'll just watch and see if Tony joins. We do have a quorum. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so I'm looking for item number two, approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to that? So moved. Thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, Larry, Tom. second. Okay, Tom, Larry, um, thank you. Uh, all those in favor of approving the agenda as published, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Welcome those online. Uh, we looks like we've got a good turnout. Um, Carlos is back. Woohoo! Um, so, uh, a uh, good list of folks and good participation. Thank you all for your time uh, for this committee. I really appreciate it. Um, 
Item number three, uh, public comment for items not on the agenda. Anyone on the committee would like to make a comment? Um, this is this is Cindy, and it's not on the agenda, but it appears that Calhan passed the joining of PPRTA. So I'm sure you guys will hear more, but I wanted to um, thank you and we'll be joining. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Cindy, for bringing that up. Uh, Rick, you have anything you wanted to add? No, just that the, on the clerk and recorders website, the latest count we had is 97 in favor, 74 opposed, um, with almost all the ballots counted. Cindy, do you uh, have anything more current than 97 to 74? No, and that's the latest and it's been that for quite a few hours. So um, I doubt that it will change. It's a, you know, 10%. So, um, but it is not official yet. So we'll make sure it's official before anything, but looks like it. All right, that's great news. And, and just as a general comment, that's gonna drive changes in the uh, IGAs between all the member governments and voting distribution for different committees and this, that, and another. So stand by more things to follow uh, as this moves through the, the process. So um, good news. Any, Rev? Congratulations, Cindy. No, oh, thank you. Uh, anybody on, oh, wait a minute, Rick's got his hand back up. Bev will cover this uh, in a few minutes, but um, Calhan, if the board uh, does the final approval on December 8th, Calhan will get maintenance only, but they will get maintenance funds starting with the FY22 budget. So that changes Bev's budget presentation to you today, but she'll cover that. I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Okay, go ahead, Dave. A related question then, does Calhan uh, need to think about appointing a person to this committee as well? Yes, they will. And this came up in a board meeting um, in terms of the number of people now that we've added another one, how many votes they get in order to maintain the majority for the city and the county uh, and not be overruled by little ones. So the details of how many votes and, and all that stuff are to be worked out. Okay. There's been some preliminary stuff going on, but yes, they will have them a member on the board and they will have representation on the committee. Good. And so Cindy, I'm thinking should start thinking about uh, seeking a citizen volunteer to join this group as well, because we'll probably need one. Is that right? Um, one from Calhan. One or two or 1.25 and just a person <laughs> just shows up quarter of the time or something. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, all those are in discussion with the board and the, and the lawyer and to be, resolved. Good. So yes, thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> any members uh, online got anything uh, they wanted to say? All right, not seeing any hands raised, we'll move on. Um, do I have a motion for approval of the minutes of the October 6th meeting? Uh, Jim, I would like to propose a change to the minutes. Okay, Larry. Um, in the first item number one, it says call to order. It said the uh, meeting was called to order at 1.30 p.m. Is that correct? Oh. I was going to say, or was it, is it a typo? Was it 103? <laughs> Good catch. Right. So did we did say we what, uh, one o'clock then? So I'd like to uh, propose that uh, change. Okay. And with that change, I'd like to propose uh, approval of the minutes. Okay, we have a motion to amend and approve changing the time from 1.30 to 1. Uh, any further discussion or changes? Second. second. I'm sorry. Okay, David seconds. Uh, thank you. All those in favor of approving the amended minutes say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Minutes are approved. Beverly, item number five, financial reports. Uh, good afternoon. Um, do you mind if I sit there? No. Can people see me? I'm a little headache and I'd rather just be sitting down. 
So the financial statements um, for August sales and use taxes, we received 12,995,000, which was 645,000 above the amended budget or 5.2%. So far this year, we're 5,773,000 above the amended budget of 100. 38 million. So we're going to most likely have a really nice carryover this year. And then next year for our amended budget, we'll most likely, if this trend continues, be increasing the sales and use tax budget at the amendment time. So on page two, then compared to last August, we're ahead by 2,068,000 or 18.9% for the month and I had 18,217,000 year to date. So that's that's a really, or 23.7%, that, that tells us more than comparing to budget quite, quite well. And then after that, we have the regular uh, financial statements, the revenue and expense summary, and then the capital comparisons for both the um, initial A list and then the um, second 10 years A list. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions for Bev on the budget? I mean, on the financial report, sorry, budgets later. Okay. Right. Thanks, Bev. Okay, so then we'll go on to the budget. And the budget this year, what we're going to try with the CAC and see if this works for all the members is we're going to try to go over the budget generally and which I will do and then if you would like the best we're going to try this approach you ask the member government staffs questions about their particular budgets um, or they can come up to the podium and go over a few things, but not really super long presentations. So we're gonna see how that works and hopefully everybody will be pleased with that approach. So let's go to the budget and go to page four. Page four is the allocation of revenue. And we start out with 138 million in sales and use tax and interest is estimated at 250,000. Then we subtract the sales and use tax collection costs that goes to the state of Colorado for collecting our sales and use tax. And then the administrative costs. And then we um, add back a reserve adjustment. And that's because of a change in revenue from the last time. So the reserve adjustment is a 10% uh, of the total revenue and there's been some changes. And so we have a little bit of a change there. Then 10% to transit of 13,679,000, maintenance 47,875,000 and capital 75,200,000 and almost 33,000. And then the maintenance allocations, the next section, the capital allocations, the next section, and then transit, their allocation of 13,679,000 plus their estimated fare box revenue and other revenue of 2,578,000. Now I passed out um, a new calculation of the allocation and the only thing that's changed, and this one includes Calhan, and up at the top it says including Calhan. And this changed a little, um, and it reallocates the 47,875,000 of maintenance. Um, capital isn't impacted uh, until 2025 is when Calhan will start receiving a capital allocation, and then transit isn't impacted either. So. In December, the board of directors will um, approve adding Calhan, and then this budget will change in the maintenance portion only. So pretty straightforward. Um, Calhan, the other page that I passed out, 
was the memo that Cindy prepared for Calhan and what they will spend their maintenance on and the 53,075 repairs for Colorado Avenue and Calhan Highway is what Cindy's saying at this point for that in the budget. So that's pretty straightforward um, there. Then the next section of the budget is the revenue and expense summary. And that's just taking the revenue, alloc putting it in that format, and then the expenditures that each of the member governments um, did. And then the next section is transit, and then the city of Colorado Springs, and we can go through those with their staffs. I don't know that they're making formal presentations, like I said, but they're definitely like a question and answer period. I wanted to go over the admin page, which is at the end of the budget, but this is kind of um, page 39. It's the usual personnel costs and indirect costs, and those are from PPACG, and that's a contract with PPACG um, for Rick and I, and then um, the other, Jessica, and if we have maps done by somebody in mapping and any transportation things that are done by transportation staff and so on, um, those costs go in that area. And we usually save quite a bit of that. This is kind of a figure that we never seem to meet, which is good. And then that comes back in the budget for the next year. And then the contract services, legal, we have a lobbyist, a state lobbyist auditing. And the big item here that we don't normally have is the ballot measure expenses. And we estimated those at 500,000. We really don't know what they're gonna be and it all depends on how many things are on the ballot at the end of November for the next uh, capital 10 years of capital, but it, it could easily be 500,000. Anyway, and then insurance, other operational expenses, that's for anything else like computers and things like that. You normally don't spend that much, but public outreach activities, which is the annual report. So right this year, we're at 1,228,000 for 2022, which is 87% of the allowable one percent. Does anybody have any questions for me concerning admin? Oh, not seeing anybody raising any hands. <clears throat> um, I do have just a general question, and and it kind of affects the city's programs. Um, we had this discussion within the board several months ago, but in the projects the the project funds where we list phase one that seems to bring up a question of why is there a phase one if there's a phase one there must be a phase two and everybody's focused on they were bored was focused on why aren't we getting to phase two so does that have to be in there i mean what was the ballot language does, it, do, it was so phase the ballot one. language had, uh, sorry mr Robert gill sort of at city of colorado springs um if you go and look at the ballot language um, for in 2012, there was phase two on the B list. So, for example, it would be very, uh, the reality is it'd be very difficult to transition from phase one to phase two, with the exception of maybe the traffic signal upgrades, you know, because it had a specific number associated with it. Um, it's interesting, we we're having this exact same discussion on how we would like to present that for the ballot language um, for this next one. And so I pulled those. Today I have them named phase two, but it's whether or not we continue with that naming convention or modify that. And so yeah. there's some internal discussion going on with that right now. Good, because it, it's really a continuation of effort uh, versus a d distinct phase one, phase two thing. And my concern was there was some discussion about, well, let's just stop funding phase one, get the list done and go to phase two, which is my understanding of what these were that wasn't as easily done as it sounds when you say it. And, and so I was just curious if 
going forward, do we have to include phase one, but you're addressing it, so that's, that's good. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be revisiting that topic, but I know back after this, my next meeting is on this topic. Okay. <laughs> Rick. Okay. In, in looking at the 2012 ballot, I can confirm what Gail just said that in, in almost every case, wherever there's a phase one, that's in the A list, and wherever there's a phase two, it's in the B list. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Rick? Yeah, I just wanted to ask on the administrative. Now, that million dollars for the, the, um, all the new program they're coming up with for uh, making estimates on projects. Is that coming out of this and how is it, if so, how is it going to affect it? The, uh, the estimate of PPRT3 estimate cost is going Oh, to they're already budgeted. They're in the carryover for admin. Okay, so it's not coming out of this one. Okay, thank you. So it's not right. part of this number? No, right. it's not part okay. of this number. But it is in the budget because it's in the carryover column from a prior prior years. So, but it's not on it's not in this year's allocation. Because we didn't add to it. Did that answer your question, Rick? So there's no new FY22 money for the engineering cost estimates. It's it's all carryover from prior years. And and we'll cover that later on the agenda. There's a memo in your packet the the million that was available, the, the board only approved half of that. Or five hundred thousand for the engineering cost estimates. We'll, we'll cover that shortly. Okay, so should we start out with transit? And I believe Craig, are you going to come up and talk about the budget or, or answer questions? Yeah, we're going to try try an approach where we just answer questions instead of do a huge presentation. He's saying thank you. Sounds sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> does anybody, I guess, have any questions on on the transit uh, budget that's been included in the in the uh, agenda packet? And like, if there's any major changes for this year, just some highlights, maybe. Sure, just a, um, a couple um, highlights. Uh, first, again, Craig Blewett, director of Mountain Metro Transit, um, also participating virtually as Brian Batuli, our usual representative to the CAC, and. And Lan Rao is out um, in virtual land as well, and you can help with any questions that you may have. Just some headlines, I guess. Um, you know, our at Transit, um, it's hard to just look at the PPRTA budget and and get the full idea of, of where we're headed with Transit. So, City General Fund, we actually had a, a net increase of six hundred and fourteen thousand um, dollars this year compared to last year. Um, we do meet the maintenance of effort requirement. Uh, maintenance of effort is $5.7 million and the city's contribution next year in general fund will be $8.3 million. Um, and there's also $500,000 um, in our budget next year in the CIP portion of the city budget uh, to help with the uh, scoping of our downtown transit center project. On the PPRTA side, um, there's a healthy increase you know, across the board, 1%. So the amount that comes to transit from the, uh, the tax revenue is 31% higher in 2022 than compared to 2021. And that comes out to $3.25 million. Um, I guess in terms of uh, just major initiatives, we are continuing to add service. We're addressing our, our driver shortage issue. Um, as you can see in the budget, we, have, we do have significant carryover, but there's a carryover drawdown plan. Um, part of that is an additional $2 million a year um, we anticipate to address the driver shortage issue um, in terms of increased uh, compensation to drivers. So those are probably just a couple highlights, but uh, can be happy to answer any other questions you may have. Brian, I got one, I mean, <clears throat> I got one, um, Craig, the, um, I noticed that you're purchasing more bus, uh, seems to be purchasing more buses this year than in previous years. So that, that's highlighted in your thing. So yes. you're upgrading. Are those the electric buses that you were talking about a couple of months ago? So we are electrifying our, our fleet. It's really a demonstration project at this point with a smaller number of buses. But yeah, we have four buses. Um, we'll have arrived last week and this week, battery electric buses, which is awesome. Uh, but we're also expanding service. Um, most of the service that we're adding is off peak, which does not require additional buses, does require additional drivers. Um, 
but uh, we are continuing to replace the fleet that ages. We needs this useful life, and we are adding electric buses. Thank you, Dave. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Blute. Good to see you. As always, keep up the great work. And you folks are doing some sensational uh, work there, given the difficult circumstances. Hey, help us understand the ARPA uh, funding contributions here. Or uh, do those monies run out? I don't see them on the revenue projections. I was wondering. Uh, help me understand why they're absent or how they may play a role here. So, um, in terms of relief funds, you know, there's CARES Act funding, there's CRIS funding, and then there's ARPA funding. ARPA funding we got in the amount of $7.2 million, and that's fully dedicated to our downtown shuttle that will uh, start before Memorial Day of next year. There's another headline I left out, um, but we are yeah, uh, going to be adding launching downtown shuttle next year. So, so the funds are, then help me understand, contained in the, the summary of revenues? Um, good question. So uh, Lan out there might be able to answer that question. Elaine, you on the line? Yes, I am. Um, um, the ARPA funding, uh, I think Craig mentioned, it's it's hard to see um, everything, all the funding sources coming to transit without seeing the big picture. Um, in short, the ARPA funding is not included in this uh, budget. It is coming from the grants and paying for uh, downtown shuttle operation, and that's part of the big transit budget, but not specifically in PPRTA budget. Could you hear that okay? So it is excluded from the PPRTA budget. It is just purely uh, federal funds. It requires no match. Just, just to be clear and correct me if I'm wrong, but what we're seeing here in our packet is just the RTA question, not the full transit budget. Correct. <laughs> Any other questions on transit? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Gail Sertum at City of Colorado Springs. Um, just to give you a couple of the highlights from our proposed budget, as you'll see um, for our capital A list projects, um, with the uh, increase in the budget allocation this year where we've seen pass, it really has given us an opportunity to try to accelerate some projects. Um, so for example, um, we've in, we, not only do we have a cost increase, but we were able to advance some funding on the 8th Street project. Um, the El Paso uh, Bridge, we're able to move um, forward actually with the second amendment for the 2021 budget, we were able to move that forward. Uh, the galley road bridge replacement it was able to move from 24 to 22 for construction so that will be another project we'll be able to demonstrate uh, work on before the ballot in november of 22. Uh, the tut avenue phase two project the phase two of the tut avenue extension um, is also moved from 24 to 22 and the west fillmore bridge replacement which is up there near coronado high school we were able to move funding from 23 into 22. Um, this also gave us an opportunity to really look at a lot of our bridge needs, and we have increased our emergency bridge fund. I've got a couple bridges out there that I've got some great concern on, one of which is the, the Tejon um, bridge that supports the UP Railroad that we've talked about, that we do have a design project on, and we will be talking about that a little bit more when you discuss the grant application the city is um, applying for. But those are that's just one of the highlights of bridges and highlights of uh, features of the city's capital improvements um, planned with the 2022 budget. Um, Craig already mentioned the transit budget. Um, I will mention maintenance budget. You know, we're going to continue uh, with our typical maintenance uh, activities focused primarily on roads, but with some uh, 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 br additional bridge maintenance activities and traffic signal activities associated with that very typical with our maintenance program. And uh, with Calhoun um, joining in the crowd, um, it does decrease um, what I've shown in the memo for the maintenance budget by $36,995. But we'll be making that adjustment um, administratively with Bev. And I am available for questions. I have one, uh, Gail. I-25 ramps, mm -hmm. where's the boundary and what CDOT's responsible for <coughs> on interstate ramps versus the city? 
And is this driven by a city requirement? And therefore, that's why we're funding it. Is that is that the yeah. deal? Yes. Yeah. So it is um, primary. It's really all driven by a city requirement and need um, associated with it. So um, where the cross or any modifications to the ramps or what is CDOT property and the A line of the or the what they call the A line of the property or the boundary, um, we would be doing modifications of the wraps for the benefit of the traffic operations we would like to see outside of the, the boundaries of within CDOT's control. Um, so one of the problems we're really trying to address here are a lot of operational issues we have down in that intersection. So for example, we end up with trucks that um, really need to be going to Motor City or maybe we can provide a dedicated way for them to get in and avoid having them avoid going down Tejon Street and then getting in the Tejon Cheyenne Mountain that five point uh, roundabout which by the way if you haven't seen it there's a lovely video online that a truck and trailer cannot traverse that roundabout because um, it's really intended to make that more of a local street but anyway kind of interesting the other thing, one of the objectives for this project too, we'll really try to get those primary modes. A lot of folks that end up on Tejon Street, which is really meant to be more local when it gets there, are really intending to go to Nevada. And then we have some cut through and some safety issues that are going through. So the project will really be trying to make that primary movement uh, sh showing folks going from Nevada uh, or from the interstate onto Nevada. Um, we will obviously have collaboration with CDOT since we're planning on touching the ramps. Um, but it's really in uh, coordination up front in the design portion. And then there's some administrative documentation we need to make because of the uh, connection to the interstate. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chair? Go Carlos ahead. here. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, quite question for the city. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I did have a question about the emergency bridge funds. Uh, Gail brought that up just uh, briefly there, but it looks as though we've increased that by $2.6 million. A little concern that maybe we reduced uh, the citywide intersection improvements uh, program fund and the traffic signal system upgrade program fund. I just wanted to understand if there's no negative implications or impact on those other two programs since we've increased our emergency bridge funds. I, I just wonder if you could walk us through that. Uh, all right, Carlos, this is Gail Sturdivant again. I will do my best and please uh, let me know if I miss one. Um, on the traffic signal upgrades, we were not planning on having any funding available from 22, 23, or 24 in that program for those 60 signals. So in 21, that was the last year to fund that activity. And that's been planned. And so if you were to go and look um, at our uh, quarterly report, you can see that was the plan all the way along not to have funding in those years. So there's no impact to that program. They're gonna be wrapping up that activity with available carryover funding because there is some money still in there, but there is no additional funds in 22. Um, intersection safety improvements. Um, that is relative to the same amount that we've, again, we've been having planned um, through the capital program. If you go again, go look at our quarterly reports and see our overall capital improvements program. You will see a decrease in what the 21 budget shows primarily because we added funds in 21 and I believe it was the first budget amendment. And it was really to address some of the systematic intersection safety problems that we are experiencing um, on Mark Shuffle Road. So we had added funds on that to address a specific problem in 21. Um, and then emergency bridge, you know, we, uh, we've got a very comprehensive bridge program we'll go through and evaluate. And I mentioned the Tay Home Bridge because it is a fractal criti fracture critical bridge today. Uh, we have some others that we're having to do very um, increased inspections on that we, we, there is a potential we could have a need at any time that we would have to address it. And we wanted to be able to be prepared for that and advance some of the designs with some of these replacements that we know are gonna hit us. Um, I also wanted to be able to have funds available in emergency bridge, if need be to support uh, the Chrissy grant application for the Nevada Tejon bridge replacement project as well. Um, if we were successful with that grant with the local match, we would likely transfer uh, the remaining balance um, from emergency bridge into that project to support that activity. Did I hit all the pieces you asked me, Carlos? And, and if not, please let me know and I'll address those as well. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, if I can respond. Yes, that was my understanding that we were, uh, you know, going to be wrapping up those uh, traffic signal upgrades. Uh, I do know we have several more years left on PPRTA. I just wanted to make sure that that uh, was indeed that those programs were complete, I should say. Um, 
we do have, uh, but we still have, you know, a growing city here, and we still have these needs for uh, intersection improvements and traffic signal system upgrade. One of the concerns, though, from the CAC, and you know, this is just a general comment, is that, you know, this emergency bridge fund is really just truly for emergencies. It's not intended to be kind of a flex fund for general maintenance type work. So, you know, it's definitely we want to plan ahead. We want to have those funds in there, but uh, that that's just something that has been brought up in the CAC before that, you know. This is really truly should be for emergency type activity, and it is a pretty big line item in our program budget. So we just have to uh, hope our bridges stay together at least for as long as they can. So appreciate appreciate the comments there, but you did answer my questions, and, and I appreciate that. So thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Rick had a question. Just a word of advice to the member governments um, in PPRT to the city specifically put 60 locations on traffic signal system upgrades uh, for the city and all the member governments, please pay close attention to the numbers, if any, that you put in the ballot because Bev and I will have eagle eyes and be, be counting. It, it's interesting to say that Rick, again, the meeting I have after this is to talk about what um, RTA three projects and some of the programs uh, we would likely merge intersection or signal upgrades with intersection improvements because a lot of times when we go through and, and need to do the signal upgrades, they can frequently be associated with other intersection safety improvements. So, but we'll be looking at those definitions and what's included and how they're described in the future. Either that or I've got some nylon uh, tie locks you can put around your wrist in case you want to tie your hands doing things. Yes. <laughs> in case we have another robust funding. So thank you. <clears throat> okay, Jennifer, your turn for the county. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, um, uh, Citizens Advisory Committee, Jennifer Irvin, County Engineer. Um, just a brief highlights. Um, you'll see primarily the, the bulk of our funding uh, for the capital program is actually going into the South Academy project. Um, that is because we are nearing uh, the end of the design phase uh, this year and we are anticipating going to construction early next year. So or at least advertisement and, and working with CDOT on that. So that is that is one of the elements in the MAMSIP grant. So, um, th that is uh, why the bulk of our funding is actually going, if you look at it, $17 million to um, South Academy. We, we have some allocation to Eastonville Road. That's a backfill of some money that we had transferred out of that uh, project for line item transfer um, here in the last year or so. And then uh, a small amount to, um, uh, I think, uh, sorry, the, the Deer Creek project that that is under um, getting under design. So, um, and, and then for our maintenance program, um, this year we have um, uh, fourteen million dollars, approximately. Uh, similarly to the city of Colorado Springs, with Calhan joining, and, and we're very excited about that. They're a great neighbor. Um, that our budget will uh, will be working to adjust that with Beverly. Um, our change is about fifteen thousand dollars, and so. Um, uh, primarily that will be used on pavement, concrete, and then some of the materials for our folks who are doing road work and, and we'll be bringing any contracts forth uh, for those for that program as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions for Jennifer? Mr. Chair, just a quick question. Go ahead, Debbie. Uh, uh, South Academy, tell us about that. Is this the South Academy piece over Fountain Creek, Chen, or is this South Academy that uh, combines with the CDOT project at Pikes Peak College where the new Sam's Club and I-25 comes to South Academy, or is um, it both? So the boundary of the South Academy project is from the Bradley ramps to approximately I-25, and just because of the tie-ins, it goes a little bit past I-25, but that's primarily, um, so that project is taking the four lanes to the six lane section along that, and then also doing the bridge work. There's six bridges on that corridor, um, uh, rehabbing some of those bridges and doing some of that work. So, um, and, and that was part of that is uh, part of the overall MAMSIP grant. Um, and then um, the CDOT is also doing work at the interchange there as well um, with that MAMSIP grant. Um, so it's there's a lot of coordination going on and, and they're getting underway with the I-25 project, if you haven't noticed, and, and we're right behind them 
with the South Academy project. Yeah, that's my question. So, so they're not actually, it's not like there's one big project that CDOT's running or you're running, right? These are two standalone disconnected projects, sort of. They're standalone projects. It is part of the, it was part of the MAMSIP grant because that grant, um, we had identified that project um, and it was really showing a local match for the overall program. Um, but it is a standalone project, but there was a lot of coordination in designing that project with CDOT just because they are doing improvements on the bridge over, um, over South Academy, the bridges over South Academy. And, and then we're working with them at, at on the signals there at that interchange as well. So, and, and they're paying for some of those signals. So, um, there is um, the ability to, uh, because we will be working with CDOT's contractor. And so we are taking advantage of all the prices that they have with that, um, with that contractor, um, just because that grant is $350 million. So that was part of the, the, the impetus in, in working on that. So we are, uh, because of the um, uh, uh, efficiency of that, working with their contractor as well. Well, a great, great answer. Great job as always. If I could suggest one technical uh, recommendation, the, the furthest most west signal in that series, this is where the county, the city and the state all deny responsibility. I've complained a number of times to the city, they say it's the states. It's the one where actually where uh, the uh, 115 and South Academy, Broadmoor Bluffs and all the streets uh, come together by the Safeway, but it's, it's the first signal or the last signal in that series uh, as you get on academy but it, it does not coordinate and the city said it's not their job uh, please go away <laughs> so if you'd be so kind to have either the state look at it maybe the city could revisit that or uh, you and your uh, wisdom with your connections can look at that but the, but but i would think that regardless the public doesn't care that they pass through three jurisdictions it's a single corridor and they should all be coordinated i guess is my point my colleague is sitting right here. I'm sure we'll talk about it after the meeting. Um, I do know for a fact that it is not the county signal, so. <laughs> oh, good, okay. <laughs> uh, but but there are uh, several signals out there that, you know, there's a lot of coordination on and, and sometimes it may be a, you know, a certain jurisdictions and another may do the timing. So for example, our signal there at Venatucci and, Highway, uh, and South Academy is a county signal, but uh, we work with CDOT and they do the timing on that for us. So oh, there, there is a whole lot of coordination as we are cross-jurisdictional and, and I'm sure Gail and I will speak about that before we leave today. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Zalmok. Now there is, it, correct me, but isn't there a companion city project from Milton Proby down to Bradley that's doing some work that you guys are working on too? Uh, Mr. Chair, Gail started at City of Colorado Springs. So there, Right now, there is not a project between Bradley and Milton Proby Parkway. The city has two projects north of Milton Proby Parkway. There's a piece from Milton Proby up to Fountain and then from Bijou right. to Airport, right. the other segment. Um, there was actually a federal uh, project that we have between um, Airport and um, now in Fountain. So there's three other projects north, but there is a uh, there will be a gap and additional work between Bradley and Milton Proby. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? County? Go for it, Beth. Okay, so the next one is uh, Manitou Springs, and I don't know if Jeff Jones is on the. Yeah, I'm here, Beth. Okay, great. Um, so, Jeff will give you some highlights and then any questions for him? Yeah, just a few highlights. Ours is pretty straightforward. It's it's definitely not as complicated as El Paso or Colorado Springs, I'll tell you that. Uh, so I'll just go right into it real quick on the maintenance allocations for 2022. Uh, we have 338,000 basically and our revenue carryover is 48. We have a, a fund total of 386,000 basically that we're gonna use all for paving of Manitou streets. Uh, as far as our capital allocations, um, we have a total allocation of 2022 for about $639,000. Uh, between that, we're splitting uh, 400,000 on transit shuttle parking and about 239,000 on downtown, Manitou downtown sidewalk drainage and utility effort. Uh, the carryover we have from 2021 for transit shuttles about 220,000. And then the carryover for downtown sidewalk drainage and utilities is approximately 227,000. Uh, with that, <clears throat> uh, we have a total of about 1,087,000. 
but we are taking $200,000 out of that to pay back to El Paso County uh, for the WAPS project, the money we borrowed against that, the joint effort on the West Colorado Avenue. And that money will be coming out of the Manitou downtown sidewalk and drainage utilities, leaving approximately 467,000. And our total uh, allocation for capital then would be 887, 126 for the projects. And with that, I'll take any questions you may have. All right. A uh, question, you... Jim. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have to allocate any money to Calhan, or is that just uh, Colorado Springs and the uh, county? You know, I don't know the answer to that because this is the first time I've been a part of a new entity joining in to the, of the IGA, so I'm not sure. Um, okay, I'll I was take just that curious. question. Um, okay. This is Bev. The, um, the maintenance is allocated between all the member governments. So Calhoun will get approximately 53000 and a little comes out of all the member governments based on their population share. So it'll impact everyone's maintenance budget, but not the capital or the transit budget. Okay. Get, that's you, good to know. get your answer, Ed. Yeah. Yes, that's what I needed. Okay, so Jeff is finished, and then next we would have Angie from the town of Green Mountain Falls, and I'm not sure she's online, but theirs is very straightforward. Um, they'll be receiving the uh, 45 thousand and then um, they will have zero carryover for maintenance and they always spend it on the same type of thing which is small road enhancements and chemicals and materials for their roads out there in Green Mountain Falls and then um, the Belvedere Avenue is finished so all of their capital allocation with their carryover the capital allocation of 82,756 plus a carryover of 243,000 equaling 326,000 will be used for stilling basins. And I believe that they are starting those very soon and working on that capital project. So I don't think I can answer any questions for Angie, but you never know. So <laughs> I don't know. Are there any? Cause we can definitely See if we know the answers and then ask them of Angie if, if we don't. All right, don't see anybody raising your hand. Okay, and then the last one is Rayma and that's Cindy if she's still online. Oh, I see her, yeah. Yep, I'm here. Ours is pretty basic. Um, we have a bunch of carryover because I've, I got a grant last year and I was kind of saving up the money in case we needed extra money, but we will definitely spend some money next year on maintenance. And I think we'll get our grant done as well. So do you have any questions? I guess we've got to start asking you, are you speaking for Rayma or Calhan? <laughs> right now I am Rayma. I <laughs> actually talked to my public works director here in Calhan, and I'm thinking he's going to maybe join the CAC for Calhan. If I didn't get somebody to do it, I was probably gonna switch over, but if I can get him to represent, I'll stick with Rayma. There you go. Okay, great. So that concludes the budget presentation. So what we will need is um, to go for a vote to either recommend that the budget be approved as it is, with the addition of Calhan when that happens in December or something else, depending on how the CAC feels about the budget. Right. Red? I'd like to make a motion to recommend approval to the board as submitted with the addition of Calhan. And Tom Vieres, but uh, second that. Uh, any further discussion on the recommendation? Yes, sir, Larry.
Um, does the motion include the administrative budget for 2022 or just the budgets that we've gone over for the different entities? Does that include the, the budget? Yes, the, um, the administrative budget is part of this whole budget. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? <laughs> Not seeing any hands. All those in favor of the recommendation to approve the budget with the exception of Callahan say aye. 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 Any opposed? Speak now forever. Hold your peace. All right. Very so good. So you Thank said you. with the exception of Callahan, what it was. Weren't we was including with the Calhan? Of I said Calhan. Included. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I say exception? Yeah. I'm sorry. Wrong word, inclusion. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, item number seven, capital maintenance and public transportation contracts, City of Colorado Springs. Yes, Mr. Chair, Gail Servant, City of Colorado Springs. Uh, the city is pleased to bring uh, five contracts for discussion and consideration and recommendation to the board. Uh, the first one is actually more of an administrative change order for the Academy uh, Boulevard project. Uh, this actually is effective for both uh, Bijou to Airport and the Fountain to Mountain Proby Parkway that does allow for um, rate changes and any kind of acknowledgement of position description changes for the city's procurement rules. AECOM is our contractor and again that is a no cost change order um, and they have committed to completing the current scope of work um, under the current uh, costs um, even with this change. Uh, the city's second contract is um, the Galley Road Bridge over West Fork of West Sand Creek uh, replacement. As I mentioned during the budget, you know, we're able to accelerate that from a 24 to 22 project. We, our last time we brought a change order was just to advance the project to 90% because we're accelerating and we were going to let that sit for a year or two to get ready. So, so pick up any changes at the end. Now that we're targeting for a 22 construction, we're going to change order to advance that design from 90% to completion for to have it ready for bid. Yeah. And there is a, a vicinity map in your packet for that if you need a reminder where that is located. Um, the third contract is for the Rustic Hills paving phase two. Um, as you, if you're familiar with this area, this is a, a little bit of a, a more mature uh, gravel road neighborhood that we've had a plethora of drainage and roadway issues over the time, over time. In 2020, we were able to complete phase one, which is some of the first uh, paving in, in conjunction with some st uh, stormwater improvements that were done by the city stormwater enterprise. We are now preparing to do uh, the phase two planning and paving work for us in this first contract was to, to have for the engineering and utility coordination uh, component of that. Uh, we're looking at having Kimley Horn do that design work for us um, in the amount of $251,325. There is a vicinity map that really shows that general neighborhood. Um, I will say it's generally uh, bordered by uh, Constitution Avenue and Murray and more towards um, the southeast of that intersection. Uh, the fifth contract is for the cartograph uh, license renewal. That is our asset management software that rides on our GIS backbone. Um, you've seen this before that we take this license agreement um, and split it across um, different departments and uses across this, um, across the city. The total contract amount for the city is one hundred ninety nine thousand six hundred seventy two dollars and sixty three cents. Uh, the calculated PPRTA portion is $63,993. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> you state that it's spread across several departments. Mm -hmm. uh, PPRTA is picking up, what, 100% of DPWs for your, your no. department's piece? No. no, that is not correct. And I, I don't have all the breakdown in front of me, but we basically take that $200,000 charge and split it out by all the licenses and uses. So for example, Stormwater Enterprise is actually part of Public Works. They pay for a fair portion of, of theirs as well. Mm -hmm. The Parks Department uses that. So that comes from a completely different uh, Parks Department. And then City's General Fund does pay for some of that work as well. So is PPRTA paying for the entire engineering cost, engineering department's seat cost? No, and they, we really, 
do it more from our, our from our overall maintenance budget. So, for example, because this is we really use it more for maintenance operation and maintenance of existing assets. So, for example, if you go and look at our maintenance budget, you'd see two C paying a portion of it, stormwater their maintenance piece of it, PPRTA maintenance component of it. Uh, Parks has it for their assets. Uh, traffic has a, a small portion of that as well. Um, I think there's a couple other city departments. I'm just have we missing historically right now. done this before? We have. And then uh, the city's fifth contract is really um, an overall listing of our on-call or annual contract renewals. You'll see there's a large list attached there. Um, as always, these renewal contracts um, are, these are really more time extensions to keep them in place. And any task orders issued underneath these contracts will be done so based on um, appropriated funds and contract approvals as required by both the city and PPRTA as necessary. Um, I will point out that I know that the circle one comes up as a portion because the city's overall contract is just under 4.3 million. The PPRTA portion of that um, is anticipated to be 200,000. And then um, uh, there's one on there that's with uh, Schmidt Construction that's just a time extension only with no available dollar amounts on it just to do some close up with them. Um, so those are the city's five contracts. I am available for questions and would ultimately request for favorable recommendation to the board for approval. Rev has a question and then Rick. Gail, the backup, I assume the backup for item number three, I don't think it applies. At least my understanding is the bridge that is literally just to the west of the road going in, which states village or no. Space Center Drive that goes into Walmart. That's the bridge that's being worked on. The bridge. That, oh, you're talking about the Galley Road bridge? Yeah, Galley Road. Okay, sorry, let me back up. And it shows it, the one going under the road at Wooten. It's actually go, it's going over, the bridge itself is going over the West Fork of Sand Creek. And I, and I apologize, I don't actually know what the business names are associated there to understand, I think, exactly what you're asking me. Well, I, quite frankly, I don't know which is the West. So this because is- Because there was a, literally a former member here mentioned another bridge on that same galley road that's even further West. And I think that's one, and literally, right. when I say that, they talk about it, Rick might be able to address that because they mentioned another bridge that's over West Sand Creek, I say bridge, it was actually a culvert that collapsed on uh, south. But I'm not sure anymore. Yeah, I, I pictured it as that bridge right there by the yard, the um, street yard, where it's narrower and they have to, there's not any uh, room for walking, you know, pedestrian or anything like that. Well, that's where the I curve see. comes out and does yeah. that. Yeah, it's right there almost where uh, Corey's uh, kind of yard is. Yep. It kind of down in front of UPS down mm -hmm. in that, that yeah. general area. Yeah. yeah, and there is an Ent Bank as well. I'm getting IMs from folks that maybe know, know the area <clears throat> a little better than me that it's, there's an Ent Bank there. You think about this, this is west of, I'm sorry, east of Powers between oh, I know where it is. Um, Murray and Wooten. So this doesn't even refer to that one because uh, if you go down to Murray, you can see the UPS, and it's it's actually Emory Court that turns in. That's where that bridge juts out, and they've got the circle around the one on Galley Road. That's a it's actually a channel on Galley Road that carries across, and I'm assuming it's in a culvert because Brian West is the one that brought this up. So this isn't the one then that's and Rick, you're familiar with here. It's not the one that goes into the Walmart, the back entrance to the Walmart. No, no. But that one's, they've literally been out there with the stuff and they cut trees and everything. The bridge actually carries four lanes right now. But that's, that's, that's right. That's a fair amount further east 
yeah. than, than this one. Oh God, yes. It's probably three quarters of a mile. Yeah. It's between, it's between between Murray and um, Powers. And like I said, right there in front of Corey Parkes's yard in where the District 11 that would has be, their buses and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, that would be close to the galley row or the one at uh, Wooten. Right. But the one she's talking about that she's gotten information on, where it goes into GPS, uh, UPS, I mean, literally is in Marie Court on this. And I'm not, well, literally, I don't care which one it is other than the work that I've witnessed that they've been doing has been preliminary work for the, and don't ask me which for. So the, we do have a developer doing work that is the east of this bridge location. That would be the development that's just north of uh, Corey's offices. East of that, where are they cut all those trees? Yeah. That's, that's a big developer. There is a development project, yes, yeah. just to the east yeah. of this project. And I think that's likely what you've seen, because you're right, they have been doing some work out there. That might be why I'm confused with what you're seeing. Okay. But but they're not doing any work on the bridge itself that's over Gallup, is what I guess I'm getting at. Well, they, they well, will, this is, we're still in design. We're gonna be replacing that bridge that goes over, the, the galley bridge that goes over uh, Sand Creek in that area. They haven't started this work yet. They're, they're working on design. I'm I'm fine with it. I'm just it's I don't understand where it's at. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, and I do have and if if there's additional questions, I, I can give you more information on the breakdown for the cost of the uh, the cartograph software. But for example, IT uh, has a portion of it, as I mentioned, stormwater general fund. Um, Parks and then America or uh, Pikes Peak America's Mountain also pays for a portion of it as well. And it's split proportionally based by the licenses. Rick, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of things about the Rusty Kills area. Um, Tread lightly now. <laughs> Be gentle. <laughs> okay. Have you been warned? <laughs> no, no, no. It's uh, this is a very vocal neighborhood that's had a some long term issue. Yeah. So, uh, don't ask me a lot of details. <laughs> I was president of the association for oh, 11 perfect. years. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. No, what I wanted to ask is one, you're going to do the drainage first before you do the paving like you did in uh, phase one? Right, uh, they are. So, you know, in phase one, they did some major drainage downstream. And then when they went through, did the paving, they did um, some drainage work associated with that. So the right. stormwater and phase So yes. So they, we are that's gonna, gonna be done first. They're gonna be done together. That stormwater is paying for that at the same time. And they're doing that as literally probably in one contract with the same contract okay. doing it, but being split out. Did the other, um, there was an you said this is going to be a, a study uh, plan on this thing they have that already done that was done a number of years ago so we there is a very high level portion of it was done that we had a lot of lessons learned from this last round and we're doing some engineering work to have uh, things go a lot smoother when we get to construction and planned out um, more so than what we had previously but you're still going to do the, the ditches on the high side and the trail on the on the low side of the road? I couldn't tell you the exact cross section in each, in each of those right now. Well, but what, in general, though, the plan that was put together, um, it was probably four or five years ago. That's but correct. they're they're starting from that and they're just working on a lot more detail on that than what was um, included in that previous plan. Um, so for example, um, there's a lot of utilities in there that are very, very shallow that they had a lot of conflicts with. So they want to go through some resolution with that. And they need that both from the drainage standpoint and for the road work. I understand. I'm going through and doing that. So I would I need to talk to you or somebody about the, the layout because they, the original plan had us with the, the horse trails on the on the lower side of the road okay. and the tra and the ditches are cut out on the top side the high side of the road. And, and then they also uh, changed the width of the, of the blacktop 
to how much room they have to use the work so we can still keep the trails gotcha okay right. well in general i think again the overall plan is the intent is to follow that plan just get more detail that was to keep from having a lot of the conflicts they encountered in the first okay uh the well, first it's gonna be a little easier because you're going to use flatter ground so i hope so and when is this going to start so we're just doing the design work. I've got, um, because of the, the maintenance carryover, I've allocated uh, maintenance money um, from 21 to start doing the, the next part of the paving this next year, if we can get it done. And then we'll likely have to come in and do a third part, but it would all be done under this plan that we're gotcha. developing now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to thank everybody for RTA, for finishing Constitution Avenue paving from Brady to the Powers. Oh, yeah. That was miserable. Yeah. There. So thanks for that. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on um, city contracts? Craig? Uh, Craig? The one with the face ah, on it. There we go. Uh, Craig Gooding, Green Mountain Falls. I have a conflict with the fifth item on this list, and I'll have to recuse myself from this vote. As do uh, Scott Barnhart and Karen, uh, according to the notes on the on the screen. Okay. So Karen, and who else? Scott, Scott and Craig have conflicts, and have recused himself for the record. So. Um, David, does that put us in a, in a position where we lack a quorum then, or any concerns about the number of votes that would be cast? Okay. And thanks for bringing that up. It just uh, we, I'd rather not break it out unless it's a contentious thing, and and as long as we can still meet the quorum thing, then we just record that for the record. That's typically what we've done. Um, okay. I'd like to move that the uh, city's request be approved as presented and with the clarifications made by Gail. I have a second. second. Who, who, who second it? Ed. Ed Dills? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, all right, any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the city's uh, contracts say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Rick. So the, the vote would be 14 to zero with three abstentions. So uh, our quorum is nine. So we're, we're still good. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> item 7B, a request for letter of support for federal grant for capital project. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Gail Sturdivant again. Um, as I mentioned previously when we were talking about the budget, and I believe I may have talked about this high level um, a couple months ago, the city is going to be pursuing a federal discretionary grant referred to as a CRISI grant, which is that Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements Project, to assist with advancing um, the PPRTA A-List project, which is the uh, UPR Nevada Avenue and Tejon Bridge crossings. Um, that project is really uh, renamed as the South Downtown um, Rail Underpass Reconstruction Project, uh, being because not only do we have those two rail bridges that are name in the name project, as you look at the overall bigger project and the, the altern alternatives analysis that's been completed to date, there's actually desire, and as the track gets realigned, it touches the bridge that goes over the rail bridge that goes over Shook's Run, and then there's some linkage with the the uh, Las Vegas Street Bridge that also goes over Shook's Run. So what we're going to be doing is looking to federalize um, this project and really with the attempt one to be able to position ourselves for other federal uh, grants for construction in the future. And as I put in the memo, uh, the overall project estimate at this point is $86.8 million. And it's really something that would be very difficult to complete with NPTRTA3 when you go and look at, I think, the overall body of some of the bigger projects we're going to be looking for. And with some of the other tie-ins with the railroads, and we think that we could, we could position this project well to compete for construction funds in the future. But to be competitive, we need to go through this first 
phase or what's it referred to as track two to complete the preliminary engineering NEPA and tee it up. So uh, with this, this with this first grant asked, the city is going to be requesting $2.5 million with our local matches, $1.3 million. And then we would be using the efforts that had already been expended on this project to help advance it through this overall more global engineering effort to move forward. Um, the city is asking for PPRTA um, to provide a letter of support um, in the city's efforts for this grant. Okay, Rev. Re I recommend approval of the, recommending to the board approval of going after the grants. I think they're, it's a great long term relationship they'll set up with not only the railroad, but the current administration in trying to get what are, I guess they're called shovel ready projects up further along. And I see a big bunch of money coming. So we have a recommendation to recommend to the board that we approve. Do I have a second? Second, um, Jim Moore. All right, thank you. Um, uh, any further questions for Gail? All those in favor of making a favorable recommendation to the board say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you all very much. Thank you. Item 7C, El Paso County. Good afternoon again, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jennifer Irvin, El Paso County. We have three items for your consideration today. Um, the first one is our Eastonville Road Corridor Project. Uh, last year, we completed a traffic study. And um, so this year, we are moving forward into design. And so uh, we have uh, completed an RFP and uh, we are recommending Stanley Consultants uh, for about $1.557 million to complete that design effort. The second item is our Deer Creek Road Base Camp Way Microscope Way Project. Those are three roads in the northern area of the county, and um, this is the first contract for this project. And so uh, we are looking at um, design efforts for that, and that is with AECOM for about four hundred and eighty-one thousand dollars. And then finally, um, we are working still to do the final closeout for our Mark Shuffle South project, um, and so. This uh, approximately $15,000 will um, complete um, a survey and uh, water quality. Uh, this is within the overall project budget. It just, it wasn't in the contract. So we needed to amend the contract to add some additional dollars. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Hearing no questions, I would like to move for the approval of these three projects as Jennifer has presented them to the board. That was Larry. Second. Do I have a second? Second. And Rev, Rev for second. Uh, any further questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I got a question, Jennifer, not related to this project. Are they going to extend that service road past the high school, up past Old Antlers and, and connect it like it used to be? Or is it the road going to go through the neighborhood to connect to County Line Road on the north end? Paralleling the interstate up past the campgrounds and the high school? Oh, uh, Monument, oh. Monument so, Hill. So uh, Misty Acres will actually extend north. Um, it dead ends and it doesn't hit um, County Line Road slash Palmer Divide Road <laughs> today. That will be the main um, road. And then that one would be extended, extended. We expect that to happen through the development process. And as a result of that, uh, Monument Hill Road will be realigned. And then Monument Hill Road will actually intersect into Misty Acre Boulevard some, somewhere within that, in, um, that development. So that um, is part of the reason why we ended up not doing significant improvements up in that area because we knew that section of Monument Hill Road it, as it is near, very near uh, County Line Road would be realigned and essentially abandoned. Okay, so. all right, thank you. I just was up there the other day and I was trying to figure out where all things went. So thank you. Yep. All right, um, we'll move on to item number eight, uh, member governments and other reports, um, transit, 
that I'm missing. Good afternoon, uh, Brian Vitulli. I'm the Transit Planning Supervisor with Mountain Metropolitan Transit, um, the Transit Services Division of the City of Colorado Springs with your monthly transit report. Uh, for September of 2021, for our fixed route service, uh, we provided a little over 166,000 trips for that month. Um, that's down um, one and a half percent from September of 2020 and still 43 percent down from September of 2019. Um, Starting the middle part of September, September 16th, we started to operate a Saturday service uh, during weekdays. Um, our fixed route contractor is still struggling with, with uh, recruitment and do not have enough operators to operate the service um, at full peak service. Um, and we're, we're still continuing with that schedule today. We, we're still operating a Saturday level service Monday through Saturday, and then Sunday service on Sunday. We're hoping that that gets better, um, but that's that's where we are right now. For our ADA paratransit service, we provided um, about 8,800 trips in September of 2021. Um, that's 31% down from last September and 30% down from September of 2019. For our... Uh, Taxi choice option service. Um, you know, we just restarted that service uh, a few months ago, back in March. Um, we see we provided uh, 63 trips in September of 2021, and that's uh, down 87% going back to September of 2018 because it was discontinued during uh, September of 2020. For van pool services, um, that's our Metro Rides van pool program. We have uh, 38 active riders making um, 921 trips in September. It's 45% down from September of 2020 and 70, almost 75% down from September of 2019. Um, so that's it for the monthly transit report. Just a few items to report on. Uh, it's not, not in this report here, but uh, we, we just have a fully executed contract with our preferred consultant team um, to start the Amtrak Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Station Location Study. So we're, we're probably going to have an internal kickoff meeting this month, and we'll uh, you know, start start doing the data collection and the analysis of existing conditions and, and all of that, but probably we'll have a full full on kickoff meeting either in December or likely in, in early January. So that, that's an exciting, exciting project. Um, I can report more on that um, at the December CAC meeting, but basically we are charged with identifying a, a rail station location site. Um, somewhere in the Colorado Springs region here, along the existing freight uh, railroad right away. And, um, you know, it should have good connectivity to the rest of our transit system, um, you know, potentially tying in more into our downtown area. But, um, you know, the consultant team will be doing a lot of analysis, um, a lot of coordination with the railroads and uh, Amtrak and CDOT is a, is a major partner in this. So this will be a really exciting project. And, um, you know, it's not very often that I get to work on railroad stuff. So this is, this is really exciting. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hey, Brian, when you come back in December on an update on that Amtrak thing, will part of your discussion include what the expected or forecasted travel passenger travel is for that thing what I'm, i haven't heard any numbers and maybe i overlooked it on some of the preliminary studies but i'm really curious about what's the anticipated volume of traffic on this thing well um all of that was actually identified um during the front range passenger rail alternatives analysis so that that report is already done Okay. So fine. If you go to the Front Range Passenger Rail um, website, project website, you'll be able to read all the prior work that's been done, um, the alternatives analysis that was done, 
and there will be ridership projections and all of that. So we're we're not we're not actually all we're charged with is identifying some suitable locations for for rail a rail station. Um, and you know that the 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 more urgent need is identifying something for Amtrak because the extension of the Southwest Chief from La Junta to Pueblo and Colorado Springs will likely come a lot sooner than Front Range Passenger Rail. So, um, you know, we, we need to meet the needs of, of Amtrak's service, but also um, find a site that would be suitable for Front Range Passenger Rail as well. I, um, yes, sir, Richard. I've got a question. Uh, who charged you with uh, finding the best place for an uh, Amtrak uh, was, uh, where they should uh, have a uh, place to uh, let off and accept passengers and why? Well, you know, our, our region here is part of the Front Range, uh, Amtrak Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Um, a former city council member, Jill Gabler, still represents our region uh, on that commission. And as a, as a partner of that process, um, just as Pueblo has done, you know, they're, they're somewhat way ahead of us um, in identifying a rail station. Pueblo did all the work on that and, and we're expected to do the, the work on identifying sites. Um, because you know, we, we know the local environment better than Amtrak or the, the commission does. So that's, we're, we're glad to help in that capacity. Well, um, Brian, well, can I add on to Brian's answer really quick if you don't mind, Mr. Of Robertson? Course. Um, you know, in addition to being charged with um, having this location, you know, we were able to uh, obtain um, TAP funding, federal funding to help assist with this study. So we were charged with doing it and then we were able to get funding to do, um, to do the project. But I will say it's really important for us, particularly as we're going through Connect CUS and the city's transportation master plan study, that we have uh, direct input on how all mobility options look like in our city. And this is important for us to be able to have that station location tie in with those efforts and a lot with what um, uh, Brian and his team does with a lot of Mountain Metro and making sure we're having as much mobility overlap and giving people different uh, transportation options. I think uh, there's no question that uh, uh, the city and the uh, and our transit people uh, are probably in the best position to do it. Uh, it's just that uh, I um, am always concerned about uh, passenger rail and the forecast. Uh, the forecasts are usually far more than they come up. The, uh, there are very few portions of Amtrak, I think, that show a profit or even meet the operating cost. And uh, so I was curious how the, how are their transit people got involved, but I understand Gail and appreciate it. Any other questions for Brian on transit, David? So uh, Brian, help me understand then, are there PPRTA funds involved in the Amtrak station? I don't think there are, right? But uh, this is mainly for well, information. As Gail mentioned, we received the, uh, a federal grant transportation transportation alternatives program uh, monies through PPACG, and we are providing the, the local match. We PPRTA is doing local match. We the city of Colorado Springs. Okay, but but so, so there are no PPRTA funds in there then, right? I don't I don't believe so. Uh, okay, that's my understanding. Also, just want to clarify. And it is a ninety ten split for those funds. Okay, ninety percent federal. But, but the 10% is city government funds, not PPRTA funds. I just want to I, be clear. I believe that's correct, correct, as Brian stated as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, there, if that's not the case, would you be so kind as to just share that with us? I would, uh, in that event, I'd want to uh, agree with my colleague uh, that the revenue forecast, ridership forecast for trains, I know notoriously the Santa Fe one I, I hear almost weekly uh, runs empty between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. And this would be hopefully not a repeat of what they're doing there. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, go ahead, Carl. Hang on just a minute, Carlos. Um, um, 
Rick had his hand up first, please. I, I just wanted to comment on uh, throw a flower at you. The boardings per hour are headed in the right direction. I think that's something that you can certainly take a smile at because you were, <clears throat> I think, around 20 and you got down around 10, I believe, you're back up to 14. And I think that's real encouraging on your fixed route. And the same is true on the ADA too, I believe. Yeah. So that's you guys are doing a heck of a job. Thank you. Okay, Carlos. Yeah, this is, wasn't really wanted to comment on this, but about the, you know, concerns about, you know, the viability of this uh, traffic, you know, with the front range rail. As you know, I was served on the Colorado Independent Redistricting Commission legislative. Population is something I looked at a lot. We have grown in the last 10 years, 108,000 people in El Paso County. At one time, and this may be so true, we were growing about 900 people a month. We really need to start thinking about innovative ways to move people around Colorado. So this idea that you know we're a small city, that's not the case anymore. And so I fully support the effort of our community to really be thinking long-term and addressing the needs of our population increases here in the region. Thank you. All right, uh, any other questions for Brian or on the transportation issues? All right, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, item number 8B, City of Colorado Springs Monthly Change Order and Property Acquisition. It was in your packet. Any comments or questions for Gail and the gang? All right. Um, was one's on the back? Is that, oh, real estate. Oh, real estate. Okay. All right, not seeing anything, we'll move on. Uh, number nine, administrative action and reports, uh, recent board actions. Rick? Uh, the memo's in, the, uh, in your packet, <clears throat> but I wanted to uh, highlight three items. Num number nine, the PPRTA3 matrix. Uh, the board discussed um, a couple items that I think the CAC discussed recently, um, and they uh, directed the staff to refer out uh, to the applicable member government staffs uh, the issue of whether or not there should be a fourth CTAB or a fourth HAC member, um, uh, particularly if Calhan joins. Uh, that's being discussed uh, at the city and county levels. We expect to hear back from them hopefully in December. Uh, the other thing that was, the other item that was referred out was the a base year for maintenance of effort, uh, which as the CAC is well aware is 2004 by board policy. And the, the CAC uh, uh, the, the CAC recommended the board that that be updated to something more current. The board uh, floated uh, the year 2015 and asked me to refer out to the five member government staffs, uh, the workability of 2015. And again, that's uh, hopefully uh, anticipating a, a response in the December cycle of CAC and board meetings. Um, Rick, let me uh, interrupt if I, if I sure. may on Please. that. Uh, before you move on, uh, I'd like to know uh, from the uh, representatives of the, I guess the, this is a staff function uh, that the board requested they look at it, correct? But I believe the staffs are, are consulting with their governing bodies. Right. And uh, so I guess I would start with uh, our largest member, uh, Gail. Have you uh, met with the uh, members of city council or with whom? And uh, what sort of report did you get if you have? And if you haven't, why not? I would say that staff has met. Has it didn't turn on there. You're still not on. I am seeing the uh, uh, That's the uh, podium. Podium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. 
Uh, Gail Sturdivant, sort of City of Colorado Springs. So uh, we have, we as staff have consulted with our finance office and have the data. Um, we have been in discussions with our city council members and we are not in a position to give you an answer at this point. Okay, very good. Uh, Jennifer, uh, I guess the same question to you. Good afternoon <clears throat> again, Jennifer Irving, County Engineer. Um, we have discussed this internally. I have consulted our, um, our finance and we have also spoken with our county administrator. Um, we are planning to um, have further discussions with uh, some of our board members. Okay, so you have not talked to the board members yet. We have some meetings scheduled. Very good, thank you. The uh, next item in my memo that I'd like to highlight is number 12 on page two. Uh, and this is the fourth amendment establishing IJ, which would change the board's representation to uh, from the current 33111 to 333. And what the last three being split between uh, Manitou Springs, Screamer Falls, Rama, and Callahan now that Callahan's joining. Um, so that um, fourth amendment IGA is, has been sent out by PBRT attorney Jennifer Ivey to the five member governments, City of Colorado Springs. Uh, we've, we've heard from the city clerk of Colorado Springs that they have approved it. And uh, I think uh, the Board of County Commissioners has it on their agenda for November 9. Okay, uh, and we're waiting to hear from the others. So uh, that's in the works. And then if I could uh, uh, point your attention to number 13, engineering cost estimate, you remember that the CAC um, had, uh, did not approve a motion uh, approving the um, million and change for this, but rather had referred some questions to the board, which were relayed by your chair, Jim Godfrey, uh, in discussions at the board uh, last month on the 13th, uh, the board decided to uh, allocate uh, about half of the million or exactly half a million of, of uh, admin funds for this purpose uh, and to uh, allocate shares of the half a million according to the, five, the 2020 federal census to the five member governments. Um, and that the, uh, as you're aware, the one member government that is interested in, in taking uh, immediate action is City College Springs, and I'm working with Gail, and we're close to being able to send out uh, letters to uh, engineering firms uh, to get that process started. Any, any questions on any of the other items on my memo? And uh, I'll just add that on the discussion that we referred um, whether or not that admin fund and the amount of money was the intended purpose of doing these engineering cost estimates and stuff that we had last time. Um, there was a um, robust discussion about the purpose of this and yes that it was part of the intent and um so um i did bring that up richard was there and and um, um so there was a, a a pretty good discussion on that subject and the the board thinks that it was the intent so just expand a little bit on what rick said I have a question um, regarding uh, number 12 uh, with the three, three and three votes on the board uh, when there will be four uh, other governments, if I'm counting correctly, Manitou, Green Mountain Falls, Callahan and Rama for those three votes. Is there, was there any discussion about how that would be split up amongst those four? The suggestion in that document, the fourth amendment, Establishing IGA suggests it would be 0.75 for each of the four. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, 
to be de to be continued. Yes. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on board actions or any of that? All right. Very good. Uh, so we've covered nine A and nine B. Um, yes. So nine C appointment reappoint process for citizen advice citizens advisory committee members this is uh, simply informational as it was last month it's just a reminder to folks to uh, pursue reappointment if they so choose so uh, we've heard that karen As asplin has been reappointed by ctab and i've heard that uh, the county process for dave zelenock is in process um, and then uh, the board directed me to advertise for the vacant at-large positions, which I've done. And the deadline is November 10 for at-large, regular and at-large alternate um, candidates. Any questions? All right. Um. And I have received some applications already. All right, very good, thank you. Um, 9D engineering cost estimates uh, update. I think we've already covered that uh, yeah. in my highlights memo. Uh, any additional questions? Thank you. All right, very good, thank you. And uh, 9E on the CDOT uh, greenhouse gas rulemaking. As uh, we've been discussing it, this at, at both the CAC and the board, um, I, I thought it would be good for the CAC to see the uh, additional letter that was uh, approved by the board on the 13th of October and that uh, board chair Randy Helm signed and that we sent in to CDOT regarding the uh, greenhouse gas uh, rulemaking. Uh, so just uh, just information. Any questions? And you also have yes. Uh, and uh, at, at the request of uh, CAC member, member Richard Robertson, I've handed out the county's uh, comments to see that at each of your places. It has the, the the bold heading on it. All right, David. Uh, thank you for sharing the county's comments. I'm sorry. So are there city comments as well? Or is the city silent on this? Right now, there is there are no separate city comments, and we've really been relying and working in collaboration with PPACG and doing one consolidated effort. So, like when we had the, the last hearing, um, Andy Gunning spoke on PPACG, and then Randy Helms spoke on behalf of PPRTA, and that's likely the approach we're going to stay with in this round as well. further mr chair yeah I, I would just add that um if you actually read the county's letter i mean we did submit something but it's very very consistent and and actually quotes a lot of the comments uh that we did collaborate with ppacg on so um i i know our um chair wanted to go ahead our board of county commissioners chair wanted to go ahead and and put in comments from the county, mm -hmm. um, but they are very consistent with what has been done for, for PPACG. Okay. So. The, the rules are being imposed on the MPO, the major planning organization, which is PPACG. And so that's the that's where the, the, uh, the rules are being enforced upon. And so all of the large, large range projects are in the PPACG's long range transportation plan and the short range in the TIP transportation improvement plan. And so uh, at the meetings that I've been to, to include the hearing that was held here, um, all of the, the head spokesman, if you will, has been through PPACG as, and, uh, as, the, as the MPO. Okay. So uh, there was consistency in the comments that, that I've seen in that. Yeah, that's, so that's the most important thing. I would like to applaud. I think the, the, the BOCC letter is very excellent, extraordinarily well written, uh, and nails all the points perfectly. I was just hoping, or trying to understand why there's only one very excellent letter 
uh, since there are several very excellent governments in the in the region. Thank right. You. But uh, but really, uh, the VOCC and the county staff gets in my book uh, straight A's, five stars for this uh, this three page uh, rebuttal back to the state on greenhouse gases. Thank you and kudos, Jen, to whoever uh, was part of that effort. I know it's, it's it's a tough letter to write, but it's very well done. Yeah. So by one of the proposals in the hearing was create a a internal combustion engine zone with no free zone. free zone internal combustion engine free zone by 2025 so buy your electric car now it was a it was a boulder guy I, it, so anyway <clears throat> interesting so we'll see what comes out has anybody rick have you heard any feedback comments were due last month right 13th or something like that were they yeah the, originally the 15th but then the uh state extended that to november 18 oh, i believe okay. november 18 so uh, <coughs> I, i'm not hearing that there's going to be a, a a third round of comments from pprta or ppacg but the state was at least listening and we're hearing um, what people had to say. So, yeah. Hey, I'm just curious, as part of this, um, I've heard the LA uh, basin lacks the electric generating capacity if uh, uh, to meet the electric vehicle conversion. If you project forward and pick any year you want, but 10 years from now, if uh, whatever the number is, 60, 80% of the vehicles go electric in LA, there is not sufficient generating capacity to meet that. Has that come up? I mean, does CSU have the capacity if we convert to electric vehicles here to charge those things? Everybody gets home at five o'clock, they plug theirs in and they drain the grid to zero. I mean, is that a concern that's come up that you've heard? I, I, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, I think someone did bring that up during the, one of the hearings, I, I think it was somebody online, it wasn't in the room, but uh, I have heard that people have raised that question, um, but I, I haven't heard anything specific. Yeah, the, 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 the LA area, uh, we have some folks out there with, uh, with uh, the Southern California Air, uh, Association of Governments, which is PPRC, P PPACG times 11. Uh, and, and they're pushing back hard because the capacity is not there uh, to meet the electric vehicle demand, if you uh, believe the projections, and you stop generating capacity from being increased. It's a dilemma. Well, they're going to drain all the water out of the rest of the lakes in Colorado to get it down to pass to get more generating capacity at Hoover. Oh, and, good. And, and those good. Places. So good. that's what you're going to do. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Tom? Uh, in a presentation a couple of years ago from uh, Jim Heron from Mountain View Electric, he said, if we went on the path we're on, they're proposing, they would have to double their grid capacity in Mountain View Electric to handle the amount of cars they're talking about. It just, it's, it's a great idea. It just isn't possible the way we're doing the structure today. Richard. I'm, I'm not sure what Tom's talking about, a great idea, but uh, is uh, We don't need anything. Okay. Uh, uh, I want you to know that uh, I, uh, I received the, the document I've transmitted to Rick and he's made available to you. Uh, Jennifer was responsible for passing that on to members of the hack. I didn't ask uh, Jennifer or anybody about whether or not I should uh, pass it on, but I felt I should. Uh, to this group and uh, it was received this morning. It is an, I think an outstanding document. Uh, the, a lot of effort went into it. I am uh, very pleased at what I see in there. I think it's totally consistent with the very excellent presentation made by the uh, member of the city council who's president of the board of PPRTA. Uh, he did a great job. Uh, you and I uh, were at that meeting and uh, that, that was excellent, uh, much briefer. Um, and uh, I think the local governments here and the PPRTA are working together 
as they should very closely in this. Uh, I'm not seeing any deviation, really. I think that's excellent. Um, uh, then I have to turn to my, <clears throat> I'm afraid it's going to probably not have a lot of impression on Denver and the uh, organizations in Denver, which uh, include our state legislature, the governor, et cetera, and uh, CDOT. Uh, they, um, however, we, we have to do the best we can. And I think the staffs uh, and lawyers involved have done a great job. And the, uh, our leaders on the city council and the uh, uh, board of county commissioners are to be commended. Uh, personally, I'm, uh, uh, I do, while I support every bit of that, uh, I'm afraid <clears throat> uh, I, my hopes are really focusing about three, a uh, little over three years down the road. And uh, I am pleased to note as a Virginian that uh, last night uh, there has been a small revolution in Virginia. The governor, the lieutenant governor and the attorney general of the party in power has been replaced. Effective, uh, I guess some, I don't even know the date, uh, but they, uh, all three are being replaced and I, hoping that maybe one of the two uh, bodies of the legislature uh, has changed hands. Uh, and it may signal the beginning of what we need at the federal level. And there is where the change is needed uh, to kill this uh, particular uh, terrible uh, thing that is coming out of Denver right now. Thank you. Rick. Uh, just a reminder on the greenhouse gas issue, it's just where you're adding a lane, where you're adding capacity. So um, PPRTA maintenance projects probably don't impact the, the situation and, and don't uh, cause a concern. And and probably only a small fraction of the PPRTA capital projects. Of course, it depends on what the member governments propose for PPRTA three, but uh, this, this only applies to where you add, add a lane. If you're adding bike lanes or trails, then that's a mitigation offset to, to the, where you add a, uh, a vehicle lane. So uh, just, just a reminder. All right, uh, let's move on to uh, item of or F federal infrastructure funding. You have any, and I haven't heard anything going on yet. No, there's been no final action out of Congress. Okay. Um, item number 10, a topic, agenda topics for next meeting. Anybody have any burning issues you want to talk about? Anybody online? All right. Um, any communications by any of the members of the committee you want to share with anyone? Seeing one, Scott, you unmuted. You got anything to say? No. Okay, David. Uh, I just one, one thing that was that made some pretty good media coverage recently. Uh, there is a, um, a brand new fiber optic provider uh, that's announced recently. Uh, they're providing gigabit service, which is unprecedented uh, in this region. It'll be along the lines of what you see in Longmont and Centennial. Uh, they're starting off with a $100 million project, huge, uh, building to virtually every home uh, from what I would call the Motor City Curve up to Patty Jewett Golf Course in the next year or so. Uh, that, of course, will impact uh, the transportation infrastructure in ways that I think that are profound and as I said, unprecedented. So just an FYI there, look forward. If you live in the kind of Patty Jewett, Old North End area, there's a great opportunity uh, there. A lot of media attention. I think that, as I said, it's a transformational technology 
that bridges across not just telecommunications, but into transportation infrastructure as well. So there'll be a lot of digging going on, a lot of cone it, zones. But it, uh, it looked like a um, relatively new company with a fairly large capital investment very early in there. And if I read that article right, mm -hmm. the, the company hadn't been around very long, but uh, major goals. So good. it's a Steve Jobs widow and his multi-billion dollar fortune is one of the financiers. So I think there's plenty of money. Oh, yes. And plenty sure. of interest. I'm sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, any last chance? All right. I hear a motion to adjourn. So move, Tom. Second, David. Oh, wait. We're adjourned. Thank you. He didn't take a vote. No. I rule. Chair rules. We're adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your time.